Howdy, I'm John Sharp, Chancellor of the Texas A&M University System, and welcome to another episode of COVID-19, the Texas A&M University System Response. Today, we're going to bring you two segments. They both involve the Health Science Center at Texas A&M University. First, you're going to hear from Greg Hartman. Greg is the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of the Texas A&M Health Science Center, and he's also the Vice Chancellor of Strategic Initiatives at the Texas A&M University System. Greg is going to tell us about the wide range of work being done on COVID-19 across Texas A&M's vast health science center. We also have Dr. Jeff Cirillo. He's a Regents Professor, Department of Microbial Pathogenesis and Immunology at Texas A&M. He also is the Director of the Center for Airborne Pathogen Research and Imaging. Dr. Cirillo currently is performing some important work related to COVID-19. He is leading a national clinical trial to test whether a certain existing treatment that could lower the mortality rate among COVID-19 patients. I think you're going to find what they have to say very, very interesting. Okay, we're here with Greg Hartman, who runs the Health Science Center and is also a Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives for the entire Texas A&M system. First of all, congratulations uh, to you and the medical school for your recent ranking in U.S. News and World Report, number 18 in That's primary right. care uh, medicine in the nation. That's uh, quite an accomplishment. Congratulations. Yeah, we're actually now a top 20 school in, fam in the family, in family practice care. So that was a big, big move in the right direction. And we actually improved our rankings in medical research as well, too. Jumped, right. up, jumped up in there, too. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, in this COVID-19, uh, you guys have been, guys and gals at, in the Health Science Center have been super active working with Governor Abbott on a lot of different things. Why don't you just give us a, a, an inkling of of the kind of things that the Health Science Center is doing and contributing, other than the vaccine that we're going to talk about yeah. with Dr. Cirillo. Well, in addition to Dr. Cirillo's vaccine, which is really exciting, there's actually a bunch of other work going on with the School of Pharmacy, College of Medicine, folks at the Institute of Biosciences Technology in Houston doing different forms of similar kind of pharmaceutical research, not to the level of Dr. Cirillo's trial, because again, he's using an existing vaccine, but a lot of work trying to determine are there different pharmaceutical agents out there that could be put together to maybe do either therapeutic um, care for someone who's gotten COVID or maybe a vaccine? Things like, um, you know, trying to identify, uh, doing testing of different, the mixing together of pharmaceuticals to see, does it look like there's something there? Does it look safe? Can we start animal testing? Which in most cases for vaccine um, research is what you have to first do. Again, Dr. Cirillo is able to jump ahead, which is so exciting because he's talking about an existing vaccine. But we have a lot of folks doing other work to at the beginning of some other some other technologies to try to do this. We're also doing a whole range of things, everything from our engineering medicine folks in Houston and also folks at the Institute of Bioscience Technology, working closely with the College of Engineering, have been doing production and manufacturing of N95 masks, um, 3D printing of some of the components in an N95 mask, uh, face shields, uh, working on ventilator um, type equipment, those kind of things too that we've been working with, and also just testing other ideas about how to improve the efficiency of ventilators or um, different kind of ways of caring for folks, different kind of gowns that you might want to use, and a whole range of interesting problems that hospitals have told us about that we have our engineers and our medical folks working together to try to figure out solutions to. So that's really, that's really been interesting. And then a lot of just direct care kind of services as well too. Everything from graduating our nursing classes early. Um, so those nurses were able to get out early, get into the workforce during the period of the surge to provide care across hospitals and clinics all across the state. Um, over 80% of our nurses, of our final nursing class graduated early to get out into the workforce quickly. Um, we've been doing lots of telemedicine care, particularly in rural parts of the state. Um, the, um, our group called Archie, the A&M Rural Community Health Initiative, has been working with rural hospitals all across the state of Texas, trying to help them think about how do they um, get involved in care, how we, we worked with them to figure out is there a way for them to possibly be uh, a part of the surge uh, capacity that we might need in the state if, if and when we, we start to overwhelm our urban hospitals. So that's a complicated thing sometimes. You have to figure out how to possibly bring additional staffing to those rural hospitals, more supplies. And so we've been preparing and working with them on those kind of things. The most interesting thing we've been doing just recently that's really been ramping up is working with the governor's office on developing the workforce for the contact tracing work. Um, the governor's office and the Department of State Health Services have asked all of the health science centers to be intimately involved in developing that workforce. And we're talking at least 4,000 workers that have to be recruited here on very short notice, possibly even more. And to begin working right away, 
clearly for the next three or four months and possibly as much as 18 months to two years in terms of doing the contact tracing. So when someone is identified with the virus, you talk to them, make sure they get quarantined or know how to self-isolate and then identifying all the people they interacted with in the last few days while they were contagious, talking to those people and doing that kind of work. It takes just a huge workforce. I suspect that with all of this going on, there is fixing to be a real pickup in demand and interest for uh, medical students, nursing students, pharmaceutical students, mm -hmm. school of public health students, dental students, everything related to health care. You think that's right? Can yeah, I think anything? that's true. It's interesting. We've been talking about that a lot. I think one of the biggest things may be interest in public health. We have a school of public health and both undergrad and graduate work there. Um, and we, those folks are doing some amazing work as well, too. I didn't even mention them. We have a modeling team that's been doing disease spread modeling since the very beginning of this outbreak and looking at it. And University of Texas has a team and um, Texas Tech has a team. There's lots of different teams and that's a good thing. It's just like when you see hurricane models where they have lots of different potential paths of a hurricane, the different models, modelers all use their same you know, versions of their models and it gives you an idea, but you get sort of that spaghetti line kind of distribution and it helps the planners to figure out, okay, when do we think this is gonna peak and you can even do it by city and county to some extent. So our modeling team has been doing some incredible work and, and we were the first modeling team to actually get state uh, data feeds. So we were getting information directly from the state about the disease spread as it was happening both at a statewide basis and a county by county, which gave us a little bit of a different kind of model than other folks. Really exciting work. Well, tell us about um, um, psychiatry. Is that uh, how, how big a part of that is on, in this COVID response. I know people are concerned about folks' mental health from being cooped up, as it were, and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, yeah, well, there's lots of concerns about this isolation, and you know, you got domestic violence issues that are probably going to be on the rise, and um, depression with the economic situations. So there's a lot of concern. We have a robust tele. Um, we have a robust counseling program that we have tele, tele and it's been mostly provided through telemedicine up to this point. So we've been doing lots of telecounseling. Um, particularly in the rural areas where folks in the rural areas often have an even more difficult time to access those kind of services. So that's been really important and grown over a while. And again, people getting used to, you know, talking about, you know, those kind of emotions and everything over a phone or over a computer, kind of breaking down the barrier has been difficult, but it seems to have had a lot of acceptance. And I, and I think that's been a good thing. We also have a psychiatry residency program that's fairly young and growing. And so it's, it's in College Station and actually we're going to be locating clinicians in Houston as well too. Hmm. And a lot of those folks are doing research into this area as well too. Sort of what is the impact of this? How does this kind of pandemic, it's going to have long-term interest, I mean, long-term influence on us. I think there's concerns of, you know, we'll have the people return to work, but you'll still have some of this lagging um, isolation depression and economic depression, and then even longer term, what could be some of the issues? As Dr. Cirillo will probably tell you when you talk to him, there's also even some issues about neurological issues that COVID may be creating in people who have had it. And I think the impact of those on the, the psychiatry uh, industry and neurological industry are something we're gonna be doing a lot of research on and probably reacting to for many years. Thank you very much. And thank everybody at the Health Science Center for, for making us all proud. They're doing a great job in this response and, and we appreciate everything that, uh, that's happening over there. Thank you. Yeah, your support's been very, very, very welcome too. And they are some incredible people. And now we'll have a conversation with Dr. Jeff Cirillo, who's leading a national clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine. What we've seen is that COVID-19 doesn't kill everybody. And that is a real uh, exciting thing because it suggests that if you have a good, strong immune response, you can kill the virus. Most of the world already vaccinates with this vaccine. It's very safe. It's called BCG and uh, first came out in the 1920s. The vaccine has very few side effects in adults. What this vaccine does is it broadly allows your immune response to kill almost any type of infection. So it's a very broad ability to strengthen your immune response. Now we can't really put an absolute on it. We can't show, oh yeah, this is definitely gonna have an impact yet, but we have a lot of inferences suggesting that it will. This is not a panacea, right? It, it seems to have very beneficial effects in a number of different areas, 
but it isn't specific to COVID-19. It's not going to prevent people from getting infected. So what, what this does is it buys us time. It's, it could potentially save a good number of people's lives. It reduces the number of patients that will get severely ill in the clinics and so reduces the burden on our healthcare system. But it really, we're buying time. The way I look at it is this is something that would make a huge difference in the next two to three years if we're dealing with COVID-19 still while the development of a specific vaccine, a better vaccine, comes about. I can't imagine anything more important than finding a vaccine for COVID-19. And that's why I appropriated 2.5 million from the Chancellor's Research Initiative to get this important trial started now. Texas A&M is proud to be leading this critical clinical trial. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Dr. Srello, thanks for being here and thank you and all the people at the Health Science Center for all of the great work you're doing. Uh, all of the time, but in particular in response to COVID-19. But especially you uh, are leading a, a, a national uh, tri a clinical trial uh, to repurpose a, 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 an existing drug that you think is going to be the, the sort of middle ground between, uh, allow the country to reopen. Could you just t tell us from beginning to end what your clinical trial is all about, how it started, and, and who your partners are? Okay, yeah. Well, first off, I, I want to thank you for the support uh, that you've given for the trial because we really would not have been able to begin uh, without the funds. And it's relatively expensive uh, to do clinical trials, uh, especially on the scale that we're doing it. It's a, it's a multi-center trial throughout the country. Uh, the primary institutions that initiated it, in addition to Texas A&M, are Harvard uh, Public Health, uh, Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and MD Anderson in Houston. So uh, there were a group of PIs that got together and figured out that this problem existed, that we just really don't have any therapeutics or any vaccines that are currently effective against COVID-19. So what could we do right away? Uh, we needed something that could be applied immediately because now is when the epidemic is starting to rise up in certain places or has reached a very high level in some places and we need to do something about that so one can we is there something available for that and my work uh, i've been working on uh, tuberculosis and other respiratory pathogens for over 30 years and so combined with some of the other investigators involved in this uh, led us to think of uh, this vaccine, BCG, that has been used throughout the world almost 100 years now. Uh, and we, we thought, well, this is something that we could use in the U.S., but is it feasible? Is it something we can get out to the public quickly uh, and, make, and actually make a difference in terms of saving lives, reducing mortality, uh, morbidity, and severity of disease, because really that's the key. If we can reduce the number of cases that we have, reduce the number of people that have to go to the hospital, reduce the burden on the healthcare system, we can save lives. Uh, we know, and this, this happened in Italy, it's happening in New York right now, where we're overburdening uh, the, our healthcare system uh, during this epidemic. So we need to do something now. And we went to the FDA, we talked to them a little bit about BCG, and one of the things that we found is that BCG is already FDA approved for bladder cancer in the US. So the question that we brought to the FDA is, is could we use this immediately in the public um, as a vaccination program? And they said, yes, you could, but the data isn't good enough yet. You really need to do a trial. Uh, so what we've constructed is what's called a randomized placebo controlled blinded study. So very highly scientific, rigorous study um, to, to basically, it's, the, it's called a phase four. It's the last step prior to being able to vaccinate large scale. Um, so we, if the data are really solid and we see a good effect, we could potentially do either a statewide or nationwide vaccination program. And so we, we received what's called an IND. Uh, it's an investigational new drug from the FDA. Uh, that was actually a while ago. 
Uh, and once we got that, we knew, oh yes, if this has an effect, and like I say, there's about 100 years worth of data supporting that this vaccine can have an effect on viral infections, particularly mortality that are caused by the type of immune response that happens in viral infections and a number of bacterial infections. So it's a very broad immunity and it tips the balance of the immune response more toward a beneficial response and away from the kind of nasty response that you see when people die from multi-organ failure and damage in the lungs. And so we discussed, you know, where should we go with this? What is the, the best way to apply this? Because it clearly can have an impact. Uh, and the decision was made that we should start in the, it should be a staged fashion because currently the vaccine is only used for bladder cancer in the U.S. And so production isn't huge. There are, there are good production facilities available, but that takes a little bit of time. So what's the population you would do first if you're going to stage this? And we realized that really the healthcare workers are on the, the front lines. Uh, they're the highest percentage of people that get infected with COVID-19. Uh, some medical institutions, and certainly this happened in China in the beginning, 100% of the healthcare workers get infected. And so we, we need to find a way to protect healthcare workers because obviously they're the ones that are treating people day to day that have these illnesses. And if the skilled workers, and, and I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but an ICU nurse, somebody who handles intensive care, a, a doctor that handles intubation and the oxygenation that's required to save people's lives with COVID-19, they're highly skilled. And so we don't have a huge number of these people. It takes time to train people for this. So the ones we have, we need to keep. They're very precious. And so those are the ones we're going to vaccinate first. We're going to start with those that are the greatest risk of being infected in the healthcare system. We're going to vaccinate those and then we'll stage it forward as we start to see the data. And we have kind of ethical responsibility to evaluate the data as soon as possible. And scientifically, that's not something we normally do. Normally we wait to have all of the data. But in this case, we've gotten approval to evaluate the data periodically throughout. It's a six month trial. So we're pretty certain at the end of the six months, based on the number of subjects we've done, that we'll be able to measure differences. But we're gonna evaluate it every month. We're gonna go through the entire study and, 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 and evaluate and interact with policymakers, because that's a key, right? We have to communicate the findings in order to make a difference and see whether or not it's time to actually spread it out and, and, and vaccinate more widely. So if it's successful, um, you would, um, obviously your hope is to lower the death rate. Let's say the death rate is now of identified cases, what, six to eight percent, depending on where in the world you are. Yeah. And you think that it's possible if this is successful to take that death rate to what? Well, based on the existing data with other viral infections, other bacterial infections, uh, it looks like we could drop it as low as 1%. Um, so it helps to assure that the very, very low frequencies of mortality will occur. Some of the other things that we're looking at carefully, and, and there's some evidence for that, is we could potentially reduce the frequency that people actually even show disease. So it may be that they get exposed and they show a very minor immune response, but because they're already, their immune response is ready, their body's already ready to fight the battle, that they don't really get sick and we don't really know that they're sick. In our subjects, we're following them so closely, we will know whether or not they're exposed. Because normally, not every single person in the country gets watched every single day, but our subjects are gonna be watched carefully, so we're gonna know whether or not they've been exposed, we'll know what type of response they have. Um, but yes, uh, we're, we're hoping to actually reduce the number of cases as well, as, and particularly the severity. So whether or not somebody has to go to the hospital, how long they're in the hospital, and whether or not they end up in the ICU. So whether or not they require oxygenation. We see instances where people lose their sense of smell yeah. um, and taste before they go into it, which is also um, something that happens to uh, Alzheimer's patients and, and folks yeah. that have neurological problems. Are you, part of what you're looking at is whether or not those people who have had COVID need to get vaccinated to prevent that from happening later in their life? So when I heard this, um, I, I think most people were like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But to me, I started to panic. Um, it was very scary to me to hear that 
people were having this type of an effect because it suggests, and we've seen this with other, with other infectious agents, and there's a lot of evidence in the literature now suggesting there's, when you get certain types of infections, you're predisposed, it's, they're called exacerbating factors. They make you more likely to have cognitive impairment later. And that's pretty much every type of cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, any type of cognitive impairment. So if this is happening in COVID-19 patients, it points toward involvement of what, what's called the central nervous system, our brain and our spines. If inflammation is happening in the brain and the spine with this disease, and we know certainly whenever somebody has to be oxygenated, the first organ that starts to have damage from lack of oxygen is the brain. So that suggests that COVID-19 is causing these types of problems in the brain, and we need to do something about that. Well, I also got excited by that because I realized there's a lot of data showing that BCG can mitigate these effects. Um, in bladder cancer patients in particular, it's been shown that this vaccine can reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease later in life, particularly early onset Alzheimer's disease. And that's something that we saw in the 1918 pandemic is that we saw an increase in Alzheimer's disease sub subsequent to the pandemic. So this suggests that if we can get the vaccine to individuals that might be predisposed to this, we can reduce the incidence of a cognitive impairment afterwards. And this is something we need to communicate to the public as well. I, I don't, I, I mean, I've looked around. There's very little literature on this. There's very little publicity so far. And so it's very early to be sure, uh, but I think we need to let people know there's two types of potentially long-term effects of having COVID-19 that people who maybe aren't dying may be predisposed to later in life. And they need to be aware of this. They need to avoid getting infected at all because if they do have cognitive impairment later in life, um, it's not gonna be seen until five to 10 years down the road. You're not gonna see anything right away. And in addition, lung involvement. So we know that your breathing capability is dramatically impacted by COVID-19. We know with other types of respiratory infections, you can repair some of that but some of that doesn't get completely repaired. There's scarring in the lungs and it can cause long-term damage that, that never recovers and actually predisposes you to what's called COPD. It's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where you see a decrease in pulmonary function over time and currently there's no good therapeutic for COPD. And it's your hope, and if you're right, then, then this vaccine would, would help ward that off in, yeah. in so, future years. So that's actually one of the things that's really super exciting about this is as I started to see this, um, some of my other work with respiratory diseases that I've been doing a long time had pointed toward a type of immune response that caused these cognitive effects. And none of the other studies have actually looked at this. So this is the first time that anybody has suggested to do this type of study with BCG and to look at COVID-19 neurological effects. So nobody's really done this. There's very few papers on this so far. Mm -hmm. So we started a clinical trial in parallel with the current clinical trial. We're into a smaller number of patients to find out whether or not COVID-19, one, causes cognitive effects that we can measure. And so we're gonna measure those effects at baseline and then after the study. And we're gonna be able to, for the first time, know whether one, COVID-19 causes any type of effect on the brain that could be long-term, and two, whether or not BCG, the vaccine, can reduce those effects. Uh, like I say, there's already data in the literature suggesting the vaccine can have an effect. And just to be clear, most of the vaccines that we're talking, that people are talking about are 18 months to two year trials. The reason that you may be able to produce a result within six months, or six months or less, is because it's an existing vaccine, it's already pro been proven safe, it's already been proven effective, and you, you skip the first three phases, yeah. you go into phase four, and, and, and you could possibly have it uh, in the fall. Do you, have enough, uh, do you have enough volunteers? Do you have enough subjects and people? What, do, what are you looking for uh, in terms of people to help you? Okay, so Texas A&M uh, clinical affiliates are supposed to be at 700 subjects, so 700 healthcare workers. Currently, we just started this week, so we have even just a little bit less than 50. So we can't start vaccinating until we have at least 100. Uh, so we really need to get the word out right now to all of 
the clinicians, all of the nurses out there, any healthcare worker that is in contact with patients. We need to communicate with them and let them know about the trial, let them know to communicate with myself or Gabriel Neal uh, that, that runs the clinic in Bryan, and they can get vaccinated with this. Yeah. I don't know why they wouldn't. If I, if, if I had a chance to get, get vaccinated with it, I'd do it in about five minutes. Me too. <laughs> I'm conflicted because I'm actually involved in the study, so Good. I can't be. So if you're a healthcare worker out there listening to this anywhere in the, this neck of the woods uh, between Houston and Dallas, give us a call. Yeah, absolutely. If I decided that I wanted to have this, can I call my doctor and say, uh, I have it. I assume not because you have to have bladder cancer in the United States, right? Yes. Yeah, so currently it's not indicated, so it's not allowed for patients to get this vaccine in the U.S. Uh, in a lot of the world it is allowed, uh, but we're trying to ask people to be patient, to wait for the trial data. That's what the FDA has asked. They want us to do this trial. Uh, like I say, we're going to do our best to get the data out as soon as possible, but there's also an issue of production. This vaccine is currently saving lives, both in the U.S., cancer recipients, it's, it's saving lives. Um, it also is saving lives in other countries where it's used as a vaccine against tuberculosis and they have a much higher burden than we do. So we don't want to overtax production. Right now production is a certain level. So as we start to get the data, we'll be communicating with the producers and get them to ramp up production. So if we have too many people come in right now and ask for the vaccine, other people will die because we just don't have enough of the vaccine. But it's also my understanding that Merck, who's the owner of this vaccine, has communicated with uh, their current patients and said, hey, we, we, this could happen. I mean, we, we may have to ramp up production for this. And the overwhelming response of those patients is, is you bet. Go ahead. Yeah. Actually, we've had really good support in the oncology urology group, which is, like I say, this is to, for bladder cancer. Um, they all know what this vaccine can do. And mm -hmm. many of them want to get it even when it's not quite necessary yet. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we've had a very, very positive, very, very supportive response from the majority of the okay. clinicians as well as the patients. Okay. Uh, congratulations to you and everybody at the Health Science Center and thank you for all the work that you're doing. We wish you best of luck on this and fingers crossed. Well, thanks again for the 2.5 million. I mean, the fact is, Without those funds, we would still be languishing in trying to get uh, grant funding for this. And we were all going to have to go piecemeal. So each of the different groups was applying and communicating with NIH. And I think NIH was confused by all of this. Um, uh, we, it was taking a lot more time than it was supposed to take. So uh, we're very happy to be able to move forward. We're still going to put in applications because clearly as the trial expands and we vaccinate more people, it gets more expensive. So additional funding is going to be needed down the road, but this allowed us to start now, which is the most important thing. The fact that we can start now allows us to get the vaccine to healthcare workers prior to them being exposed. And as I'm sure everybody knows, every day we see more and more infections. And so we need to try mm -hmm. to put a stop to that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for all you do. Thank you.